Um, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to um, this event. Uh, my name is John Hills. I'm co-director of the International Inequalities Institute. Uh, we're hosting um, the event this evening. Um, welcome to both those of you who are here in the room this evening, um, but also welcome to those of you who are watching this um, online um, later on through the Inequalities Institute website. Um, the next bit is only of interest to those of you who are in the room, not those of you who are watching online later on. Um, you're all welcome to come to a reception which we're holding afterwards. Um, that will be, we're not allowed to hold them um, just here, so that'll be just up the road in the Garrick um, Cafe, I'm not quite sure what it calls itself, anyway, the Garrick, which is on the corner, if you just walk up the Aldwych, um, about 50 yards, it's on the corner of Aldwych and um, the and, and Houghton Street, and there'll be somebody there to let you in, and that will be downstairs there. So please do stay on and have a drink afterwards, and we'll give you a chance to interact more with um, with Tony on his report. Um, so I'm delighted that we're um, launching the report this evening, um, and that we have to talk about it. Tony Shorrox, who masterminds um, the whole exercise. Um, um, particularly the parts of it that are concerned with inequality. Um, uh, those of you who know his work um, will know that he has a whole class of inequality indices named after him. Um, mobility indices. Mobility indices, sorry. Mobility indices, sorry. Um, and he's been hugely influential um, in people's um, thinking in different, on different aspects of inequality, but starting with work on wealth inequality a long time ago. And in fact, it's our privilege to welcome him back to LSE, where your career started, Tony, before moving on to Essex and then to WIDA in Helsinki, um, and then ending up with the exalted company of Credit Suisse, but, but based here um, in London. Um, after he's spoken, um, the discussion will be opened up by Dr. Abigail McKnight, um, Associate Professor or Research Fellow in the Center for Analysis of Social Exclusion. Um, Abigail works on a lot of different aspects of inequality, um, particularly within the labor market, but also connected with, with wealth and with um, top incomes, um, and has recently been doing work which will be published fairly soon um, for, um, for Oxfam, but also for the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, on the links between um, poverty and inequality. And um, she'll be followed by Deborah Hardoon, who is the Deputy Head of Research at Oxfam. Um, having previously been working on, and I think these things are linked, um, having previously been at Transparency International, working on corruption, amongst other things, and I'm sure there is a link there. In fact, if you've read Corruption on Your Doorstep, you will know that there is a link between some of the wealth we see around in London. Um, but in particular, I think many of you will know the way in which Oxfam has been using some of the kinds of data that Tony's going to be talking about this evening uh, in its campaigning work, particularly its Level, its level It Up um, campaign. Um, so I should warn you that this evening's events will be videoed, um, so if you need to keep your identity secret, just keep away from the camera and, and keep a low profile, but otherwise um, it will be available um, for you to tell your colleagues about afterwards. Um, but without any more ado, can I hand over to Tony? Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's always a delight to come back to LSE, which I do occasionally. Um, I'm also struck uh, by the fact that uh, having the Inequalities Institute here seems to me such a good match, actually, I think, to the uh, interests of LSE and the uh, both the academic staff and the general ethos of the place. Uh, um, and I, I can say I feel myself part of the DNA of that because I think I taught the first course on inequality at the LSE uh, back in the 70s. So um, I'm very pleased to be back and very pleased that the Institute's going. Um, you might, uh, uh, if you haven't ha got a copy of the report, there's quite a few copies available. Uh, you may think this is one of these glossy brochures that uh, some of the big banks put out and they're not, uh, they're just for their publicity uh, purposes. Um, and of course, uh, Credit Suisse do get some mileage out of it, but uh, I can assure you that it's, there's a lot of serious uh, research 
behind there. Um, in fact, we, we uh, suggest that we're producing the most comprehensive and up-to-date data on household wealth in the world. There are other studies which might look uh, at individual countries. The US, of course, has been studied quite a lot. Uh, the UK, I think uh, two of the speakers here are, are uh, authors of a book on UK uh, wealth, uh, distribute, wealth inequality, um, wealth issues. But if you ever see anything at the moment about uh, global wealth inequality, then it's actually uh, we that are producing that. We're the only uh, player in town, really, for, for doing this work. So we've got a monopoly on it, and hopefully uh, we're trying to push out the frontiers of, of knowledge as we go. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the, the material in the report, uh, but I'm also going to talk about some of the, the methods that underlie it, because I think these are quite important and they're quite novel and interesting, and they may uh, connect with other people, even if you're not specifically interested in, in the wealth issue. Um, so uh, that is the, the cover. Uh, I should also just say, one of the advantages I've found for working for the, uh, the Credit Suisse uh, Research Institute is just uh, when you're an academic, uh, when, you, when you get into publishing, you're talking about maybe a two-year lag between mm. writing a paper, going through a refereeing process, <laughs> and getting the thing accepted for publication mm. uh, after two rounds, and then having a, a six-month delay before it actually appears. Um, we had this report, we thought we'd finished it uh, last Wednesday, uh, but we spotted an error on Friday, and so we had to rewrite it, and uh, we, we finished it on Sunday, and here it is, printed here on, on Wednesday, printed and delivered on Wednesday. So this is the enormous, that's sometimes quite attractive, particularly as because we value having the, the topicality of this, you know, the fact that we're talking about data. We, we finish our data in the end of June, and then we have to write the thing. But usually by September, October, we've pretty well done the analysis and, and uh, written the report. So we're talking about really much shorter lags uh, than other people are used to. So, and I think that you know, does help, because things are changing quite fast in the world, and it's good to keep up to date. I have, uh, there's two collaborators, I have co-authors who work uh, intensively on this. Jim Davies, who uh, has another, I have a PhD in LSE on wealth, and uh, Jim was my first PhD student here, so he, we have also written on wealth. Um, he has the, the LSE connection. Uh, Rodrigo is, is um, uh, works with us on the number crunching the econometrician, and he works uh, He's now uh, working for the Central ba Bank in, in Uruguay. Uh, the sort of work I'm talking about originated when I was at WIDA. I don't know how many people. It's the World Institute for Development Economics Research. It's a United Nations organization. It's, uh, it's in Helsinki. It works on development economics. And uh, when I was director there, I had a sort of free hand in deciding what, uh, what topics we should cover. And I thought at some point it would be interesting to to, to do a little study on asset holdings in developing in, in globally uh, because I thought that was an interesting development issue which hadn't actually been picked up at any time by the World Bank. Um, and as part of this, we, uh, we were just uh, talking out loud, if you know, just talking uh, off the wall about what we might do. We thought, can we actually... Um, construct estimates of the world distribution of wealth. This was, I don't know how many people know, there are some other work uh, quite well developed now on income, uh, sort of world income inequality. Uh, I think it started with uh, Francois Bourguignon was I think the first person to write a paper, but more recently it's uh, Branko Milanovic who gets all the headlines and he's done a lot of work uh, on uh, income inequality globally. Um, he used to work for the World Bank, and so he had access to a lot of the micro data sets which he, he's using. Um, so we thought, can we do this for wealth? Wealth was much more uh, ambitious 
because there's very much uh, less data. Instead of something like 150 countries, 150 plus countries for which there's income distribution data, at the time there was perhaps uh, no more than about 20 countries that had um, wealth distribution data. So we, um, we just thought what we could do and whether this was feasible, and at least we thought uh, it's possible to, uh, to, to make an effort. And we, our strategy was the following. First of all, we collected together the data we had on the level of wealth in different countries. The ideal data here is, is called balance sheet data, which uh, a number of countries do. They essentially sit down um, and draw up uh, accounts for different parts of the economy. So they have a corporate sector, a household sector, government sector maybe, and try to estimate what their uh, assets are, what their debts are, and what the overall position is. Um, I think uh, this was done for wealth, it originated, the, the first um, ones were done for the UK, and it was done maybe 50 years ago. Um, and so they are available, but for, at the time, for a limited number of countries. Um, so we had to think about how we, how we do, how we get an estimate of the uh, total wealth or the average level of wealth in other countries, and we, we simply sit down and there's a, there was a relationship between the level of wealth and the level of income, as you might imagine. Uh, the sort of wealth to income ratio is uh, not necessarily completely stable, but at least uh, predictable on the basis of a few uh, variables. So we thought it was possible to do that. Um, so for countries that didn't have actual raw data, we thought we could estimate it. And then there's a few other countries that simply we don't even have the, the independent variables to generate estimates for. These usually very small countries, you know, Monaco, Channel Islands, uh, or they're big countries, but ones which are uh, if disconnected from the, from the global economy, if you like, uh, North Korea, uh, Myanmar, that type of country. So, um, and to be honest with you, they, you know, we could just disregard these, but disregarding them um, means that you almost treat them as if they're a random sample from the, the rest of the country. So we, we adopted another approach, which we just imputed the, to them uh, a wealth level, which was the average for the region and the income class. But most of them are low income, um, and uh, at least the ones with, with any sort of numbers of population, uh, and often in, in Asia. So. Um, this is, uh, they would get an imputed value which was equivalent to low income country in, in, uh, in Asia. So that's the level uh, issue. And then there's a question about how is that uh, total uh, distributed for any particular country? So what's the, West, well, uh, the distribution of within a country? Um, there we had data on, I, I've actually put 30 countries, but we started off with I think only 20. Um, and uh, so that's way below what we really need. Uh, we need 150 or something or to be, uh, we have 150 <coughs> countries of which we have income data. So we took the view that we thought that income inequality might be a reasonable proxy. I won't say we just use the income distribution, but there's, if you look at the countries which have income and wealth distribution data, then the wealth distribution data is always more unequal, unambiguously more unequal than the income uh, inequality data. The Lorenz curve is always outside uh, the wealth, uh, uh, the uh, income data. At least I used to say that, but I, I think there's, I think we've now had one exception. But um, you know, typically, I think you could understand why that would be the case and uh, expect that to be the case. So we thought if we could just see what is the rough relationship between wealth inequality and income inequality, we could use that to get a, a guess at the, the wealth distribution for these other countries. Um, again, uh, then we would have some averages for these other countries that we know almost nothing about. And then the third th interesting thing which we did, and uh, which has become really a quite a, a core thing, part of what I'm doing, 
uh, but nobody else has seemed to uh, uh, picked, it up on, picked up on it, is we generate for each of these countries a synthetic uh, sample. In other words, we generate a, a, a observations which are consistent with the distribution de details that we have. Um, the, uh, uh, um, and uh, we do this so that it's, it isn't just uh, roughly uh, consistent with the uh, observed or the actual data we have, it's exactly consistent. We're, if you like, just filling in the bits of the Lorenz curve that we don't actually know. I mean, usually with any data sample, we would have a Lorenz curve. Even if you had a large data set, you'd only have maybe 20,000 points. We generate samples uh, for uh, countries at the moment. We, we set, essentially generate uh, uh, a sam one uh, sample observation for every 10,000 uh, individuals. We actually use adults, uh, but in, in, a, in a country. Um, and then um, for the top 1%, we cut that down to one in a thousand, and for the top 1%, we, we generate one for every hundred. So we generate quite large samples. Um, in fact, the, the current total is, is 1.3 million. So I'm generating each year 1.3 million observations, uh, a, a wealth data set. With, with that number in. And then once we've got these things, we just process the results uh, and, and generate. So we, we, there's a huge number of things that we can do. I, th I don't think we really even uh, scratch the surface of the sort of things that we could uh, process this data <coughs> usefully on. Um, since then, there's uh, this, uh, I should say, it was, uh, I say it was uh, part of this study that we did at WIDER, um, and mm. eventually we, uh, we did a little pr press uh, release for this, uh, a press event, and it got huge, huge coverage, because this was the first time uh, we came out with a headline to say the top 2% of people owned half the world's wealth. And it, it was a headline, it, it hit almost every single newspaper around the world, it, I was actually on BBC uh, uh, business uh, news report at night. It, it just enormously resonated everywhere. Um, so it was, it was quite fun. Um, since then, uh, we've um, had, had the fortune to uh, be um, uh, linked up with the, the Credit Suisse uh, and unable to continue this work. And the current uh, study is the seventh year in which we're produ producing data, but we are all the time uh, making uh, research uh, progress as well. And indeed, the other thing that's happened is just uh, advances in all sorts of things. First of all, we've got data for many more countries. It, it, the balance sheet data now, we've got 48 countries which have balance sheet data of some sort or another, 23 have got it both for financial assets and non-financial assets, uh, finan and the others are just for the financial balance sheets. But that's a huge uh, increase on, on uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the survey data for four more countries, uh, China, India, and lately it's um, uh, uh, Uruguay and uh, Chile, I think, are the other two have got. Uh, and uh, we've got wealth distribution data for many more countries, partly because the European Central Bank has uh, decided to uh, produce uh, uh, distribution data for Eurozone countries. We've also got other new sources of data, at least in a usable form. In particular, the, the Forbes uh, billionaire list. Uh, again, 10 years ago, the number of countries that had significant enough billionaires to make it worthwhile using them, I think, for research purposes was quite small. Uh, now we've got more countries uh, and greater numbers of billionaires in those countries. So we've got, um, we've got that information. And there's also a lot of rich list data. I mean, the Sunday Times rich list uh, comes out once a year. They, they have a very long history, but there's a lot of other countries now that are producing similar things. Um, the third thing that's... Uh, that's uh, 
changed is that we've worked out some way of adjusting the top tail of the distribution. And the problem with wealth data is always that there's difficulty um, getting a handle on the top and making sure that we get something that really reflects the true distribution. Um, we've now worked out a way of, uh, I hope, of uh, sort of merging the, uh, the regular distribution data with information on the top tail via the, uh, the Forbes billionaire list. And that, uh, I'll try and persuade you, um, is, uh, is a very um, fruitful direction to go in. And finally, the, the thing that's happened in the last 10 years is that there's growing interest in, I mean, the fact that the Institute set up here, is, I think it's reflecting it. The fact that uh, Donald Trump's just been uh, um, elected president, I think, is a reflection of these things. Um, maybe uh, Brexit is a reflection, but we've had to, at least to uh, uh, help that along. Uh, the work that uh, has been done on the top income and wealth database uh, with... Uh, uh, Tony Atkinson and Piketty and so on. And of course, Piketty's book, which just, I think, has uh, very much changed discourse here. So I think these sort of things have, have just uh, made things more interesting. I should say that, uh, I mean, you know, I've had, uh, we've had correspondence with uh, Thomas over the last 10 years, and uh, we've had uh, various sorts of links in which we've been sending in material. And I think we're what I'm doing is, is very much uh, compatible or consistent or uh, complementary with, uh, with what he's been doing. So I'm not, certainly I'm not going to attempt to do some of his uh, uh, sort of linking up uh, long wealth data series with uh, macroeconomic uh, and demographic conditions, but uh, some of the other things I think do uh, overlap. So let's just ask ourselves, I mean, set ourselves down and say, okay, suppose we're sitting down and saying, I'd like to work out uh, how we, I would like to con construct uh, the world distribution of wealth. I'd like to do this exercise. Um, what would I need to do? First of all, you need to decide a few things. You've got to decide what the, uh, the definition of wealth is. Um, and we just, it's, we just take a sort of marketable wealth uh, concept financial wealth, your non-financial wealth, less the debts of households. And uh, it's probably easier to understand that by th thinking about what we don't include. Uh, what we don't include is human capital. And we also don't include state pension rights. We do try and cover um, uh, funded pension rights, but not state pension rights. Um, and if, if you want an explanation for that, it's partly because that's what household balance sheets do. They don't treat uh, state pension rights as part of the, house, the wealth of the household sector. Second, you have to decide a unit of analysis. And as you know, in most, most uh, studies in economics, they would focus either on the individual or the household. Uh, we now use adults uh, on the grounds that um, essentially uh, most wealth is, is held by adults and it's more, I think, useful. Uh, it, it's not... Uh, uh, very interesting to think of countries which have perhaps large numbers of, uh, of younger people. Uh, that sort of distorts their uh, wealth per adult would perhaps be uh, um, uh, pulled down by that. Um, thirdly, there's various sorts of valuation issues. Oh, God. <laughs> I should have said, please turn all your mobiles to silent. Okay. All right. I think that's a reporter coming trying to <laughs> from, uh, from another country. So let's uh, try and... Um, uh, sometimes I'm not sure. I give it to my... All right. Uh, someone who knows how to turn these things off. Um, one thing to do is, is uh, we're, we're doing different countries, so we've got to somehow compare their currencies. And uh, so... We could use uh, the, the standard, obviously, is, is to try to convert everything into US dollars. Um, uh, we did experiment with using PPP uh, as well uh, early on. Um, we still have a problem with current and current uh, US dollars can vary quite a lot. The exchange rates can vary each year. 
and a lot of the sort of volatility year on year um, is caused by just changes in exchange rates. So we've also, I'll also be talking about constant exchange rates by which it, we mean um, the last, uh, uh, the average exchange rate over the last five years. Um, there's other valuation issues like consumer durables, usually they're not given much valuation in, in, wealth, uh, in, uh, in wealth studies. Um, but, you know, if you, when, certainly when you get down to the lowest wealth levels, the fact that they've just gone out, uh, perhaps bought some furniture and run up a debt, uh, often you're counting the debt, but you're not counting uh, the value of the, the furniture, and that can um, perhaps distort uh, their position. Um, there's also issues to do with informed property rights. You know, what do you do when someone owns... Uh, land or buildings, but they don't actually have a formal uh, piece of paper uh, which uh, gives them entitlement to this, uh, you know, how you value these things. So you would have to, in principle, uh, think about these things or perhaps even more likely just sweep them under the carpet. But, um, you know, these are issues to, to, be, um, to be settled. Um, the other, there's two other issues which are not usually discussed but have cropped up in our work, um, uh, and that is to do with often, when you're talking about very wealthy people, they often hold a passport from one country and then live in another. Uh, you know, there's a lot of Swiss people, there's quite a lot of the Indian dis, uh, diaspora, I think, uh, would be in the same category. Um, so the... Um, uh, the, the question about how you, how you treat them is, is an issue. Uh, you can affect uh, certainly the, the inequality in a country if uh, people are uh, included or excluded. On the whole, we tend to use uh, citizenship um, rather than residence uh, on the grounds uh, simply really because it's much easier and, uh, to get data on that. And that's the way that the Forbes billionaire lists are are uh, reported. Um, the other issue here, which is never discussed really in, in when people are doing wealth studies, but I think is really, it's becoming more and more important, is what I've listed here as beneficial ownership of family wealth. And I, I, I better I just give you an example really to illustrate this. Um, I mean, a few months ago, the Duke of Westminster died, and the next day, people announced uh, on the newspapers that his son would inherit his fortune and it would be nine billion pounds or something like this. Um, and you can be absolutely sure that when their uh, estate records are put in, they will not list nine billion because even the estate, the inheritance tax on that would be, you know, four billion. Uh, nobody in their sense, my, uh, no family would be so uh, stupid to risk that sort of thing. Um, and so it's just indicative that um, very often what people might report in surveys, even if they were done very thoroughly, perhaps doesn't reflect uh, what their true situation is. And essentially, if we know something about what a total family owns, uh, but if individually they were asked, it, it probably wouldn't add up to anything like the, the amount that we think that family owns. So um, we've sort of taken, uh, we've taken another view in a, in a sense of just saying, okay, here's the Forbes data. They say this person owns this, and we've got to divide it either amongst an individual or amongst the family. Um, so that's, that's our framework. Um, and then we have to start thinking, how do we... We've made these definitions, we've sorted out these problems, or at least uh, thought about them. How do we now start to construct, to collect this data together for the world? And I think what's, you know, what's quite interesting here is how, does the, how would the top income database people approach this problem? Um, and I think it's quite clear. What they do is a sort of a brick-by-brick brick approach they look at data for one country in one year and they try to get that data uh, sorted out. And then they go for another year in that country 
And then when they've completed that series, they go to a different country and, and do that. Of course, they're, they're doing several countries um, simultaneously, and that's the way that they've done their income data. So they've constructed a lot of data, but it's you know one, uh, one sort of uh, uh, brick at a time. I started to think about they're trying, you're trying to paint a picture, and so it's more one brush stroke at a time rather than one brick at a time. And then I started to think, what sort of, uh, which sort of artist would, would represent that sort of approach? And it, it struck me that it was the uh, Seurat style of doing pointillism, <laughs> in which you, uh, you, know, you get one piece of information and then you get another one, and you try to build up a picture in little, um, in little brush strokes. Um, we take a different view, so I then thought what, uh, what uh, artists would uh, represent our method, and I come up with um, Jackson Pollock uh, <laughs> on the grounds that what we try and do is collect together all the sort of data that might be useful, and we throw it at the problem, um, and hopefully at the end of the day, uh, we get something coming out that, uh, that does make sense and uh, is, is quite uh, useful. Um, the sort of sources of inf wealth information that we use now, I've, I've mentioned already, household balance sheets, many more now, the wealth surveys. We've also used uh, market capitalization, house prices, exchange rates. Um, if any of you think that uh, the fact that we're linked with Credit Suisse means that we have access to their to their uh, individual records or something. Uh, that's not true at all. Um, all we get from Credit Suisse, they do help us to get the series on market capitalization, house prices, and exchange rates. So that's, uh, that's the sum total of what we, we get from uh, Credit Suisse in terms of our data. Uh, otherwise, it's all publicly available data that we use. Uh, we could also use, we don't use savings data at the moment, but that's also possible. For the distribution side um, surveys, there is uh, some uh, information we get from wealth taxes, inheritance taxes. Uh, that's always been a, a sort of uh, recognized uh, source of data in the past. Um, there's something called the investment income method, which I know some of the top income people are using, where you essentially, uh, you've got data on uh, incomes uh, and you try to estimate what the value of the wealth is that would generate that sort of income um, and make an estimate. Um, it used to be a sort of quite a, you know, uh, I would say a method that was used um, for a number of countries but has not been used for maybe uh, 20 years or something like that. Um, we've got the, the Forbes list of billionaires, which we do make a lot of use of, and now, and also there's quite a few other rich lists, as, uh, as I've mentioned, so these are all the things that we can make use of. Um, and uh, so when we do that, and I say, let's just look at the levels first, because I've already said what, what we do to get the levels. We, we use the balance sheet where we can. We d use regression estimates. Um, otherwise, and we get an estimate of uh, the wealth, the average wealth in each country, uh, the wealth per adult, because that's what we're, that's the method we're using to compare, and it is in current uh, US dollars. This is actually our picture of uh, what happens when we um, color the map, with red indicating those countries which have wealth per adult above 100,000. Uh, the yellow represents uh, between 25 and 100,000, green between 5 and 25, and the blue is below um, uh, 5,000. So we're talking about really a, quite a big range here. We're doing 20, uh, a factor of 20 between the, the red level uh, minimum between the reds and the blues countries. And you can see immediately, really, that there's quite a regional uh, uh, concentration there. North America. Western Europe uh, and uh, a number of the richer Asian countries, uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and plus some others, um, are the, the rich, the, the, uh, the rich wealthy countries. Um, 
the, uh, the middle wealth countries, um, a lot of Latin America, some of North Ac uh, um, the MENA region, I suppose, the Middle East, North America, uh, North Africa region, um, and uh, Russia would fall in that category. And then the, the low wealth countries, it's uh, very clearly uh, sub-Saharan Africa, excluding the, the very uh, deep south, uh, plus um, South Asia, and uh, the stands, I suppose, would be uh, would pretty well capture most of those countries, which are the well, the low wealth. So we can uh, um, we can uh, <coughs> get this uh, information. What we do, in fact, for wealth levels, I didn't mention this, but uh, the balance sheet gives us information up. There's, there's qu they're, they're quite good at updating the balance sheet information, but we're still lagging maybe one year, um, and some countries might not have uh, data that we can estimate for a couple of years. In those cases, we update it using, the, uh, um, using what information we have on market capitalization, house prices, to, to bring it right up to date. So pretty well for all countries, we might have to do that for a few months or maybe up to a year. Uh, and certainly for other countries, it, it might be several years. Um, the, uh, if we look at the whole world, the average, uh, the wealth per adult for the whole world is uh, at the moment, or the mid-2016 mid, uh, is 52,800. Um, if we look at the, uh, the top 10 countries, Switzerland is 10 times that level. Uh, but Switzerland's also just way ahead of really any other country. Um, it's, what, 50% higher than the second place country, Australia. And then there's, I don't think there's any great surprises there. United States, Norway, New Zealand, UK. Uh, Singapore might be the one that sort of hits you as being slightly uh, out of, or not uh, in the same sort of category, but uh, the one sort of emerging market uh, uh, country that's uh, in the top 10 in, in terms of uh, mean, mean wealth. I haven't uh, told you yet how we do median wealth, but uh, here's just for comparison uh, purposes. I, I thought it might be useful to put it in there. Um, the medians are, are roughly, I think, 40% uh, or something would be a rough guess at uh, uh, the average median to uh, mean ratio. Um, and you might notice some, some distinct uh, <coughs> changes. The, uh, the United States actually goes from third place to 23rd place when you look at the, uh, the ranking by median wealth. Um, some, uh, some of the countries um, uh, drop, uh, come up into the, uh, into the ranking. Japan, which has actually quite an equal uh, wealth distribution is one there that that equality um, uh, offsets their uh, slightly lower uh, mean mean wealth, um, and so it pushes them into sixth position. Um, Belgium's gone up a few places there. Italy appears as well. So there are some changes. Obviously, the median favours the countries which have more equal uh, distribution. They would be higher in the median uh, ranking. Uh, compared with the, the mean ranking. Um, <coughs> if I go on to the, uh, this is another um, chart from the report. I'm, I'm jumping around, so if you're trying to f follow me through the report, you'll be not uh, successful. Um, this is, this is a, just a comparison of how wealth compares with population uh, um, proportions, and quite clearly, uh, we've got here North America and Europe. They together uh, account for 65% of, of global wealth, but only 18% of uh, the adult population. So there's a three times uh, a factor of more than three. Their uh, wealth to uh, population ratio. Um, the um, what, what we call Asia Pacific. We actually. We don't count China and India in those because uh, we treat them separately. 
So the Asia-Pacific countries, excluding China and India, are roughly in balance. Their population and their wealth share are roughly uh, the same. Um, China and Latin America, their, their wealth, uh, their population is perhaps about two and a half times their wealth. Um, and then for India and Africa, we're talking about now the populations being ten times uh, their wealth share. So there's a, a, big, a very big mismatch uh, between their population and their, and their wealth. Um, if we look, as we do, at uh, changes year on year, we do a little... Uh, there's a few um, uh, comments in the first chapter about changes the last year. A lot of the changes are, are generated by uh, changes in exchange rates, market cap you know, uh, stock market uh, changes, and uh, house prices. Um, so if we look at this, this is a list of the G8 countries plus uh, India and China. Um, in these countries, um, you can see that uh, oh, uh, the, the red represents market capitalization. Uh, China suffered a big drop. That's because the previous year, it, um, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember, but they, I think their, uh, their stock market went up by a factor of three or something. It was a huge gain uh, the previous year. So this was just, uh, uh, just off, oh, coming back from what was an enormous uh, jump the previous year. Uh, but Italy and the UK are both uh, dropped here. Um, <clears throat> the UK, the, we, uh, we decided the end of June was our cutoff point, and of course, uh, Brexit vote uh, was on the 23rd of June. So we're talking about one, uh, most of this change here was in the one week after the Brexit vote. Uh, the market capitalization dropped by something like uh, 16 or 17 percent. And the uh, and also the exchange rate, which is the green bars there, uh, the green bars also uh, went um, in the wrong direction for the UK wealth holdings. So uh, on the whole, the exchange rates weren't, didn't move that much, except for Japan went, went up in the other direction. And when those get translated into uh, actual changes in, in total wealth, then the big winner last year was Japan which gained, I think it was um, <clears throat> $3.9 trillion, I think. Their total wealth went up by $3.9 trillion, and the UK uh, went down by $1.5 trillion. Um, and that's the, they've just had some headlines in the newspaper the last day or so, in which they picked up and said, oh yes, this is uh, in the UK papers, which are picking up on this and just saying, this was another consequence of the Brexit vote. Everyone's uh, poorer by uh, 1.2 uh, trillion pounds, um, which is, I mean, I suppose, was technically true at the end of June. It's no longer true because uh, both these things have perhaps uh, jumped, uh, have uh, corrected since then. Um, so that's the sort of thing we can do with our data. We can also look at uh, longer-term trends, and um, <coughs> this is uh, in the chapter two. We look at we do a lot of look look at, a lot at the trends. Um, last year, uh, globally, uh, wealth went up by 3.5 trillion dollars uh, to a total of 256 trillion. These are such big numbers. I don't think you can really get your head around them very well. Um, but if we look at the whole uh, growth since the year 2000, it works out at 5.2% uh, per year that, gr that wealth in total wealth in, uh, in, in US dollars has gone up. Part of that is because of changes in exchange rates. Um, if we correct for those, we get the second diagram here. And I think these are quite useful because you see some distinct differences. In, just in terms of US dollar terms, um, the first picture shows you that we've been pretty well flat since 2013. But partly that's because uh, of there's been uh, adverse changes against the US dollars. If you take that out, then you see there's a much smoother curve. In fact, uh, in the lower curve there, 
um, it, it pretty well shows you that uh, wealth has gone up the whole of the period uh, since the year 2000, except for the, uh, uh, the financial crisis where there was a big drop in, in, in wealth. Um, <clears throat> it's also interesting to note that a lot of this uh, increase in, in wealth is actually uh, attributable to emerging market uh, economies. And I've used another, uh, another uh, a chart here to perhaps emphasize that. So the, uh, we've got the world, uh, the, world uh, the North America, Europe, Asia Pacific are the, the first uh, sets of bars. And then we've got China, Latin America, India, and Africa. Well, of course, China has been the, the big uh, success story, um, perhaps not in the last uh, six years, but certainly over the whole period. Um, but indeed, if you, just, if you discount uh, exchange rate changes, uh, Latin America, India, and Africa have all done um, almost uh, you know, comparably well. The difference is that they've, they've, those countries have had quite a lot of inflation, um, and uh, that's been reflected in their exchange rates. So uh, although in domestic currencies, uh, they've grown uh, perhaps double the rate of the, uh, the, the old world and the new world. The new world's been uh, growing at twice the rate, at least in domestic currency terms. Some of that is uh, inflation, linked to inflation. Um, move on to another. We're still talking about levels now. Um, this is a look at uh, uh, wealth, assets, and debts per adult. Um, the trends in that, and also broken down into the components. Uh, so the top graph is more or less just using the previous the previous diagram, but just looking at the uh, the, the total. Um, so you've got the red curve, which is the U.S. dollars, current U.S. dollars. The green one is in constant U.S. dollars. Um, the purple, is it purple or black uh, curve, is, um, is financial wealth, and the blue one is non-financial wealth. And the, uh, the point to notice about there is that in the period up to the financial crisis, uh, it was non-financial wealth that grew at a faster rate. And it, although... Uh, financial wealth started as maybe, I think it was 55% of total wealth. By the time we get to 2008, uh, it's caught up, and they're 50-50. And then since, since the financial crisis, it's been financial assets that have driven everything. That's quite important when we start to look at uh, the inequality figures, I think, as well. So since 2008, non-financial assets have been pretty well flat, in terms of uh, uh, per adult terms. That means it's grown, but only in line with uh, the increases in the population, whereas uh, uh, financial assets have done rather better. And there you've got debts as well, which grew quite steadily in the first up to the financial crisis. Of course, it's one of the reasons why, why people think the crisis uh, happened. Uh, and since then, it's been pretty well flat, at least uh, in terms of uh, the percentage of, of wealth. Um, and finally, it's just, a, a, I think, quite a nice little diagram which um, looks, it shows the components of wealth and what their contribution is to, the, uh, to wealth per adult over this period. And what's, what's noticeable there is that since 2008, the actual growth rate for wealth has, has, has dropped quite a lot. It's perhaps uh, not much more than half the rate it was uh, in, the, in, in the years up to 2008. So, uh, um, and you could see there the, the, the blue parts are being the, the financial assets uh, a combination, co uh, contribution. So, let's now um, tell you a little bit about how we get uh, the distribution figures. Of course, we've started off, I said, where we've got uh, wealth distribution data, um, we'll, we'll use that. Where we haven't, we, we uh, try and estimate it from uh, income inequality. But that still leaves us with a problem. In fact, the, the, 
the work I told you about the wider study just used that stopped at that point. We didn't do any adjustment for the top tail. But the sort of problem we had, here's, this picture captures that. Here's the picture for, for China, and this is drawing what's called a Pareto, uh, a Pareto, a, a sort of Pareto curve, in which we're plotting the logarithm of the number of people above a certain level of wealth against uh, the logarithm of wealth on the x-axis. And very often we look at uh, the Pareto distribution, or at least people that think uh, that the curve has some resemblance to the Pareto, look for a straight line at the end there. So where it becomes straight, that's indicative of the Pareto distribution. Um, the problem, of course, is that we have a point over here, which is our, is our Forbes point, and it's telling us uh, if we extend that down, we're going to get nothing like uh, the uh, number of billionaires that w are re reported in China. That's not that surprising. You know, you don't expect a wealth survey. This was done in the year 2000, I think, the survey. We wouldn't really expect it to uh, predict very well the number of billionaires. But, of course, if we accept that the, the number of billionaires is useful information, uh, we do need to do something about it. And essentially what we do is to uh, uh, graft on a Pareto curve, onto a Pareto distribution onto the tail, and then fill in uh, the people that are missing from uh, the middle, uh, the upper parts of this distribution. But if you graft them on, then you're increasing the, the mean of the, uh, the distribution, so you then got to make an adjustment uh, to the distribution to, to correct for the, for the mean again. So you, we have to do that several times. It's a little, a little bit of a, 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 an iteration process. Um, but the, the breakthrough we found uh, in the last uh, couple of years is that we can actually combine uh, data on a number of different, uh, for Forbes data for a number of different years. And the, the trick is, instead of... Uh, Sorry, I should, let me just go back here. The trouble with this curve is if the population in China increases, which it does, of course, every year um, and in other countries, if the level of wealth goes up, then the whole curve here shifts. So without any change in the distribution, this curve can change. But if we instead, instead of plotting the log over the number of people, above a particular wealth level, we plot the proportion of the logarithm of the proportion of the population. And if we, instead of plotting the logarithm of wealth, we plot the logarithm of the wealth relative to the mean, uh, to the wealth per adult, then if, the, if, if we simply have the same distribution, but the population changes or the, uh, uh, the wealth level changes, it doesn't change the curve. And what we find then is really this is, uh, this is the picture for the UK. This is, uh, so we've taken the initial distribution we get from the UK data and then plot the, uh, the uh, Forbes data points here. And you can see how they're really rather neatly on this line. If, if, the, uh, if the, the Forbes billionaire points go up this line, it's indicating on the whole that wealth per adult is going up. So wealth as a multiple of uh, uh, one billion pounds as a multiple of average wealth is getting smaller. The number of billionaires is going up because of the increased wealth and inequality isn't changing if they go along that line. So that's, uh, but other countries in particular, some say for example China, they start with the points below the line and they cl clearly go up and that's indicating in fact that the, uh, the Pareto line is going is getting a less steep slope and there's more inequality. So you can really start to see what's happening to countries. I'm, I'm, I think it's, it's actually, to me, it's uh, very indicative of just how much information we can extract from the, the Forbes uh, billionaire data. So what I do is, then, is I take the differences, if I let me go back, um, I want to take um, down here, take this reference line, look at the differences, see if there's a systematic uh, relationship that we can then uh, identify what the components are. And uh, looking at this for quite a lot of countries, the UK is quite similar to a lot of other countries in that up to 2007, there really wasn't much difference. It's pretty well a flat line with indicating no change in inequality. 
But since 2007, 2008, the, uh, the line has gone up, indicating more inequality. So we then smooth the data by looking effectively, taking the red uh, estimates, smooth the data, and use those to generate the, the sample uh, that we use to, to do all the, uh, to generate the numbers. So, um, what do we have for the numbers? Well, first of all, we have a global wealth pyramid. You'll see there's a whole chapter about the wealth pyramid. This wasn't a term that I was familiar with until I went, uh, started uh, working with Credit Suisse, where I was, I was uh, kept being asked, you know, about the wealth pyramid. And then I thought, well, actually, that's, that is quite a nice way of looking at the wealth distribution, to think of it as a, a pyramid with a base and middle layers and, and a top segment. So you can construct a pyramid in which uh, you just make the areas proportional to the number of people. And here we have, um, uh, this is the latest data, something like in the world, 70, close to three quarters of the population of the world together own $2.6 trillion or 2.4% of global wealth. So three quarters are owning 2.4%. If you look at the top, uh, these are the, what, the people with uh, adults with more than $1 million each. There's a quite a small number of them, 33 million, less than 1%, but they actually own 45, more than 45% of total wealth. So you can start to um, you know, comment on those and, and indeed look a little bit uh, about changes over time. Um, that's quite a useful way of doing it. Here's another way of looking at the wealth distribution. I, I, again, I think uh, I always find this quite interesting. This is looking at the bottom 10%, uh, the, the global bottom 10%, and asking uh, which regions, uh, what are the proportions uh, of the uh, re representatives in a membership in each of the regions, and track that over over as we go here, as we go up the deciles. So when we get to the middle, the median, we would be able to see um, around the median wealth level uh, what is the different proportions in the different regions. And then at the top end, the top decile, uh, you can see quite clearly here, uh, Europe actually is, uh, has a slightly bigger proportion than North America. Asia Pacific's got another one, but Africa and India have uh, very little uh, membership of the top uh, 10%. But also looking at that, you see just where China is in the world. That's why I think it's quite interesting. And over time, it, it, where we started um, seven years ago, China was much more of a blob in the middle. So as a country progresses up the, uh, the global wealth distribution, they're, they're moving upwards. Uh, whereas some of the other countries, like at least uh, regions like Africa and India, they're, they're progressively left behind. The other interesting thing is that we picked up here on um, that you do get quite a sizable uh, number of uh, the richer, what you might think of as being the richer countries in the bottom decile, um, which I might have a few minutes to talk in more detail about, but at the moment I will um, move on. Uh, we've got, uh, there's data there, again we can process this, the uh, global millionaires by country. Uh, the US, there's 33 million, of which 40%, uh, 41% uh, are from the United States. Japan, uh, tw you know, in the year 2000, used to be, uh, I wouldn't say comparable with the US, but it actually wasn't, it, it was not so far behind. Uh, but Japan has stagnated in, in the wealth, uh, uh, in wealth terms for, for a long period of time. Um, it actually, I think, went below the UK last year, but because of the jump in Japanese wealth this year and the drop in UK wealth, uh, it's gone back to second place. Um, and then there's uh, you know, Germany, France, China, that you might think is really high, and it is still only 5% of, uh, of the millionaires in the world are in China. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> if we go and look in more detail at that, that apex of the, at the 33 million um, millionaires, then about 90% of them are in the sort of one to five million range. Um, we don't really get uh, into serious money. Uh, the the um, 
high net worth individuals. There's 140,000 of those with uh, assets of more than 50 million US dollars. Um, and those are, in the, in the technical jargon of the report, we call those the ultra high net worth individuals. And if we look at their uh, country of origin or residence, um, then what is astonishing really is how much the US leads the rest of the world. I think it's something like, uh, I thought it was, it looks only six times. My memory thought it was eight times, but there you are. The US is almost 60,000 of them. China is in the second place and has less than 10. And the UK is, uh, is, is much further behind as well. Um, so that's the sort of thing that we can uh, do there. Let me also now move on to the inequality uh, uh, numbers because we generate, uh, as a matter of, of course, uh, the shares of the top 10%, 5%, and 1% of wealth holders. Um, the top 10% over, over this uh, century, we estimate that it started with 49.6%. Uh, it dropped to 45.4% in 2009 and has sudden, since then risen and uh, gone up above the, uh, the top 1%, which I've used an old diagram, which is incorrect there. So um, but I'm sorry about that. But in the, in the report, you should have one which is inc consistent with the numbers I've just reported. Um, and uh, you know, we get a similar sort of pattern for the top 5% and the top 10%. Uh, there was a, uh, tended to be a reduction up to the financial crisis and an increase since then. Um, what is quite interesting is how that it seems to uh, resemble the, uh, the path of the change in financial assets, uh, which also, uh, I said earlier, uh, the share declined to about 2008 and then has since gone up. Um, but there was also the other thing which happened in the first eight years, which might be contributory, is that um, a lot of the growth in total wealth came in the emerging markets. So uh, I've got a feeling that the, I haven't done the, the actual uh, analysis, but uh, one, there's two possible explanations um, for what's happened. One is that it's the, if we look at the, uh, the portfolios of richer people, they tend to have more in the way of financial assets. So if financial assets go up in, in value, they will tend to benefit and the shares might uh, go up accordingly. Um, the other thing is that uh, as, we, uh, as countries which have low wealth uh, increase their wealth faster than the rest of the world, then there would be, um, that would also tend to reduce inequality. Uh, in, the, in the sort of jargon, it would be the between group effect um, and the within group within countries uh, inequality, but there's also the between group effect of giving more weight to, to, the, uh, uh, to the countries which are, to the emerging market countries as they increase faster than the others. Um, I'm not sure really whether this, you know, people start to uh, look at these trends and, and think that uh, they can predict what's gonna happen in the future. The trouble is that we have had a long uh, bear market uh, bull market uh, in which uh, financial assets have gone up. If that, that's obviously, I think, benefited uh, the wealthier people. When that stops, uh, I don't say if, I would say when, then uh, that would uh, possibly drop off. Um, and so I'm not sure whether that will continue. We, we're still, I have to say, I'd prefer to, I'm not sure we've really analyzed the factors which affect, uh, which influence these top well, shares, um, and that's a, a good research topic for the future for someone else, I think, um, and would be good to look at. The, uh, the other uh, thing that comes out of this yeah, is um, uh, just on the, uh, I can't really stop um, talking about the median wealth, because I think this is another one of our very interesting uh, graphs here. 
The, uh, the blue graph is, is the one for the United States. The red one is for Europe. The green one is for China. And the world is at the bottom. So what's happened to the median wealth in the world? In fact, every region, up to the, up to the financial crisis, the median wealth increased uh, pretty well in all the regions. Since uh, the crisis, there's been a, a divergence between, uh, in general, the median wealth has uh, gone down. And I think that clearly is because a, a sort of increasing inequality has driven down the median. Um, and in Europe, that's very noticeable, partly because the, uh, the, up, to the, up to the financial crisis, there was appreciation against the US dollar. So it gained from that period as well. Since, since then, Europe has been very badly affected. The US has gone increasing in the median wealth, although not uh, very fast, certainly. Um, and, uh, and China also has uh, continued to, uh, the median has increased. But in all the other regions, I think uh, I'm right in saying that they, they've uh, followed the downward path. Um, I'm running out of, I've run out of time, really. So, but I, there is a little, uh, each year we have a special topic. Um, and we've, we've got a list of them there for, for previous years. Some of them, I think, uh, might be worth uh, looking back and looking at our previous reports. Um, one of them, on long-run trends in wealth levels, that I think was interesting. Uh, certainly that was before uh, Piketty uh, uh, emphasized what was happening to the wealth-income ratios, because they, they have been increasing very strongly. And we, uh, we uh, found that out uh, and reported that back in 2011. Uh, then there's the one, in 2014, we did a separate study on wealth inequality in, in trends in, in, uh, in different countries. So there's a lot more detail about that, which might interest people. Um, so I will, uh, this year, we have a, a section on the bottom billion in which we've uh, tried to take the, at the bottom 20% of the world. Um, we looked at the bottom half and more specifically at the bottom 20%, which roughly equates to uh, a billion adults, and tried to uh, say something about them. Um, I suppose in, in sort of summing up, what we found is that on the whole, there's, there's actually, in almost all regions, there's quite a few um, uh, people with negative wealth. And in fact, that proportion seems to be quite similar across different uh, countries. And I think every time we get new data coming up, uh, it seems to indicate that uh, the, the wealth share, the bottom wealth share, has uh, gone down or become negative. So you know, when we get new survey evidence, it almost certainly reinforces this. It, it seems to be, over time, there's a, a wealth trend uh, towards more people being in debt and their uh, their net wealth being negative. Um, there's various other uh, studies which we've done, uh, at least uh, information there, about, um, about the, uh, the details of this group, which uh, I will leave you to uh, read at your leisure. Um, we've, we've, done, we've, we've actually done quite a lot of uh, detailed analysis of uh, a number of different countries from their, from their uh, micro data and tried to assemble and try and get a picture of what the overall uh, um, factor is. But uh, I suppose the bottom line here is when you look at the bottom 25% in the USA or the bottom 20% in the Eurozone for which we can make those computations, you'll see that the, uh, they pretty well, their debts uh, are wipe out all of their assets. So that's the reason why they have low wealth. It's because they, they've got a lot of debts and it's wiping out uh, or offsetting all of their, uh, all of their assets. Um, I'm just going to mention at the end, uh, this is certainly uh, um, just for people's benefit, that we do have a number of, we have various resources. There's, there's not just the, uh, the report in front of you. There's some more serious research resources that you may wish to look at. There's a, an online data book, which is 150 pages of, of like, dense data, um, which is online. Uh, we do have an e electronic version of that, um, which uh, I have been asked in the past for researchers to use. 
and if they are uh, genuine bona fide researchers, I'm quite uh, sympathetic to that. Um, what we haven't ever done yet, and I just don't know whether I can, uh, you know, what, uh, what I would do if I had a request, but we do have these uh, synthetic samples that we produce 1.3 million <coughs> observations each year, and that, that would be a hugely rich data set for someone to work on. Um, and uh, so if someone was very keen to do so, I suggest they might want to contact me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, and I mean, not just for the presentation just now, but for the completely staggering amount of work that has gone into building up um, this um, body of, of material and for making it available in the way you have um, through not just the report, but through the, um, through the data book. Um, let me move straight on to ask Abigail McKnight to give a first reaction to this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I start by saying that it's a, a real privilege to be invited to uh, comment on, on Tony's uh, report. I've been a, one of very many beneficiaries of Tony's work over the years, and in fact much of my research on, on earnings mobility wouldn't have been possible without the, the work of uh, Tony, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, also, um, and it's a suggestion, perhaps to request Tony now that he's got this report out the way and he's got a bit of time on his hands, if he'd like to uh, perhaps try and help us solve some of the issues in measuring wealth mobility, <laughs> it would be very uh, gratefully received in the research community. I'm also grateful because it gave me the chance to um, carve out the time to, to read this report. And it really is a very uh, fascinating report, which gives a very rich picture uh, showing the impact of the financial crisis and its uh, aftermath around the world. Uh, in some ways, I was a bit surprised about how uniform that dip was across different regions of the world. Um, and uh, it, it did look a lot more, more even than, than, than I expected, anticipated beforehand. I'm just going to make a, a, a few points about um, exchange rates, about uh, the importance of de debt, about um, what we might need to think about doing in terms of government-held assets, and if we have time, just uh, very briefly about think, just sort of throwing it out, what, what does this all mean? Just before I uh, move on to that, just to highlight some of the interesting facts that I read as I went through, and I've been working on, on, on wealth and, and income for, for many years, and um, Tony's really just scratched the surface of the amount of information that, that's in the report. Not only that, but he threw in some extra analysis, which is not there uh, for the presentation. There really, there really is a lot there. And I think some, just a, three or four of those uh, interesting facts that I found is that since 2000, household wealth increased at an average annual rate of 5.2%. And I, in terms of the figures in the report, I, I work out that's about 12% of GDP, world GDP. I, you know, I think that, that is quite astounding. I mean, it's a very large increase um, at growth rate over that, over that period in, in wealth. And that um, although uh, wealth growth has been uh, trending downwards uh, for the world as a, as a whole, there's been a very good recovery in the US. Again, I was quite surprised about that finding, even, even though you know, I, I, I do work on, on, on wealth. That 2010 to 2016 recovery in the US, I think, is really quite remarkable. Will it continue? We will see. Um, I, I was very welcome that uh, the, the, this report had looked at, at the bottom billion, which is a, a group which um, perhaps it hasn't uh, has, has much attention paid to as, as it should have done. And I think what's very interesting about that group is, that, again, a figure in the report that 44% of the bottom billion are debtors, just to show how much debt uh, there is around the world. That's in the bottom uh, quintile. And that only 9% of US adults have wealth less than the global uh, median. I think this kind of demonstrates the richness of the, the information that, that is in the report. Um, and, um, you know, I would, if you haven't read through it, I'd encourage you to, ha to have a look. It really um, covers very, very many areas there. I have a few queries then about exchange rates, uh, the role of debt uh, and student loans that I'd like to just um, raise in, in this discussion. 
It's quite clear that the country comparisons are very sensitive to exchange rate fluctuations. Um, some of these are shorter term fluctuations, and then it just depends on the point at which you observe the data. I think Tony's pointed out that the end of June for the UK was perhaps an unfortunate time in which we, we made that assessment. And longer term trends, obviously, over years we build up a picture and they're, they're a bit more reliable to try to understand um, what's happening. But of course, for the people living within countries, those exchange rate movements, uh, they don't have uh, an such an immediate effect. And I think what's um, interesting about, about these exchange rate uh, movements is that the exchange rates move largely based on speculations about what will happen in the future say the Brexit vote, the speculation there about what was going to happen to the UK economy in, in the future. But they bring forward the impact of those things right into the uh, present day. So um, by affecting the value of goods uh, that we import or export, and if we try and value the stock of wealth, it has an immediate effect on, on how we might value that. And so I did wonder, you did mention about uh, whether we, we should look at um, uh, kind, of, kind of purchasing power parity to, to do a, a kind of evaluation there rather than just, just by um, exchange rates. Secondly, the, the role of uh, debt. Um, as is uh, pointed out, credit facilities actually give people access uh, to uh, asset accumulation. This leads to rises in asset prices and therefore increases the value of the stock. But of course, credit needs to be paid back. It's uh, your foregoing income uh, for the future. And the credit crunch, of course, can have an, a reverse effect. I think the main <coughs> anomaly here in terms of debt is, are student loans, where we have no um, asset to, to offset. Um, it's about a future flow of income. As you quite rightly point out, um, there is a, a mounting student debt um, in many countries, and it's very uneven across countries because some countries actually uh, will finance your higher education. You don't need to take out a loan. Some have introduced student loans um, recently, and that will in continue to have an effect as we move forward with it within those countries. There's quite different differences between countries um, in that regard, and it can really affect inequality measures. So. Um, I mean, debt is one of the things that really drives differences in inequality of wealth between countries. So, for example, um, Sweden, where there are, um, student debt is, is very high, it makes Sweden look like a very high, high inequality country. I say not all debts are the same, and is there a better, perhaps a better way that we might assess that? Finally, uh, just very briefly, on government-held assets. Um, so I'd like to encourage Tony or Credit Suisse to think about how we might find a way of incorporating a, a measure into the analysis. And again, because I think it's very important for understanding cross-country differences. And I would use Sweden here as another example. Uh, wealth uh, held by private households on average is very low. They do hold quite a lot of debt actually, for, for, as I said, for, for student loans. Um, but inequality in Sweden is, is uh, wealth is very high, and much higher than you might expect in terms of uh, income, inequality, in, uh, income inequality measures. And that's because of the state holds a lot of the assets on behalf of the population. Instead of saving, they're paying taxes. Uh, their uh, home ownership uh, rates are much lower because they're government, uh, uh, um, public held um, housing stocks. And um, they have good health. Uh, and pension systems set up by the state. So if you looked at wealth in, in, the, in Sweden, it wouldn't be a very good indicator of welfare as it, as it might be in, in other countries. So I'd encourage you to think about that. Thank you very much. And Deborah. <clears throat> Thanks. So I'm going to start by quickly explaining why I'm here in a, as a discussant on this panel. And I'm from Oxfam, and Oxfam exists to fight poverty and injustice, and that's led us in recent years to focus very much on inequality, and that's because of the increasing compelling evidence that shows how inequality hurts in the fight against poverty and social injustice. The World Bank have been saying now for a few years that unless we reduce inequality, we will fail to eradicate poverty by 2030, and so on, um, but also because whenever we look at the distribution, the economic distribution, 
region, we see that the level of inequality is really quite alarming. We see it in cities when you've got slum dwellers living next door to some of the most valuable real estate in the world. You see it in firms where you've got CEOs earning hundreds of times what the ordinary worker earns. And you see it in the income distribution data, which finds that on average, people are living in countries where inequality is higher today than it was 25 years ago. So with that background, Oxfam also wanted to look at what the wealth distribution looked like. And we wanted to look at the wealth distribution because it matters for the bottom of the distribution and it matters for people at the top. So when it comes to the bottom, and here I'm talking mostly about people living in poverty in poor countries, we know that assets and wealth are really important for people to be able to respond to financial shocks, to pay an unexpected medical bill or respond to a poor harvest, for example. But also because wealth and assets, especially when it's land or if it's livestock, are essential for people's livelihoods. Meanwhile, at the top of the distribution, we know that wealth begets wealth. Uh, you know, as Piketty has shown, the, the returns you can get on your capital can be even greater than the rate at which the economy is growing. But also because wealth also gives you power and influence. And what we found in our research is that that really does distort institutions and policies so that they end up working in the interests of the very wealthy and not on the majority and particularly people living in poverty. So that's why we're really interested in the wealth distribution. And when we're looking for some data and some, some data on the wealth distribution, we turn to the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Data Book because it was and is the best and most comprehensive data source available that tells us what the global wealth distribution is like. And we always knew that wealth inequality was more unequal than income inequality. But when you look at the data set, and again looking this year, it's just shocking. It's really quite startling. If you look at the bottom 50% of the world, you know, the three and a half billion people that live in the bottom half of the distribution, that group have less than 1% of total global wealth less than 1%. Meanwhile, at the top of the distribution, you've got 1% of people that are now have more than half of total global wealth. Like, this is really shocking and powerful stuff. In fact, we looked at the trend um, with 2014 data, going back to 2009, and saw that the, the share of wealth of the 1% had been growing over time. And as, as Tony kind of warned us not to, to make any projections, we actually did make a projection. And we projected that the 1% would own more than the rest of the world combined by 2016. But in fact, we were wrong. They, they had more than the rest of the world in 2015. It was a year earlier, and they still do today in the, the data set that was published yesterday for 2016. So I'd really like to thank Tony and his team for providing us with this amazing data source that's really helped us have some really powerful statistics to raise awareness of the problem of inequality and call attention to the need to fight inequality. Um, so I want to kind of use this opportunity to raise three points that I think are really, are really striking um, from the data set. And the first point is looking at the very top of the distribution. I mean, it, it really is crazy. When you look at the concentration of wealth at the top, and particularly using data from Forbes as well, when you lie that on top of the, the Credit Suisse data. I mean, it's just a ridiculous concentration of wealth that makes no moral or economic sense. If you think about you know, the, the marginal utility of an extra $1,000 that could go to somebody who's already a dollar millionaire versus that what it could do for somebody who's in the bottom 50%, it, it just doesn't make sense. So the question is, how do we correct for that? Because the way that wealth begets wealth and the returns on wealth, it doesn't seem like this will automatically correct to be a more efficient distribution. So if we need something that's a massive redistribution of wealth, that there's a really concerted effort to redistribute wealth, how will that be politically and practically possible? <coughs> the second point comes from looking at the bottom of the distribution. 
And indeed, some people in that bottom half of the distribution, or bottom billion, bottom 20%, are people from rich countries. And yes, there's, there's a lot that we need to understand more about students with student debts, as I'm sure many people at the LSE will be very familiar with. But that's not really not the big story here. The, the big story is that three quarters of these people are people living in poor countries where there aren't insurance mechanisms um, and where, where really you are very precarious when you don't have any assets to fall back on. And it's very complicated and, and Tony talked about some of the problems of counting things like furniture or, or even livestock. And also we know that people's financial situations are very complicated, that at any point in time there's savings and debt and any number of formal and informal financial instruments that people living in poverty are using. But I think what this really highlights is that when we, when we look in international development and in poverty and in poverty measurement in particular, we really need to pay much closer attention to assets and debt for people living in poverty. And, and actually I was quite concerned because the World Bank very recently last month were publishing a report which was all about um, measuring poverty. And it was, it was seeking to take us beyond the very kind of crude dollar a day estimates for what defines someone living in poverty. But it gave barely any mention to wealth and very cursory attention to the importance of assets in that debate. So that's my second point. And, and finally, my third point, and this is much more kind of um, fundamental in general, I guess, but if, like me, you think that this economic distribution of wealth is economically, morally, and indeed socially, particularly when we look at what's happening politically around the world, is unsustainable, then the question is, what is it about the way that our economies are rewarding and distributing resources can we and should we be changing? Because at the moment, if you're an investor with capital, you're going to seek the investment with the highest returns. If you're a debtor, you're going to have to face the costs of maintaining that debt, and that's a, a real cost. If you're a homeowner, you've got the privilege of watching your asset increase in value. Whereas if you don't own a home, you're paying out rent. And in the long term, that makes it more difficult as rents go up for you to ever get on that housing ladder. And, and that's the way our economy is working. So the question is, and I'd love to hear from the LSE audience, what is it that we can and should change about <laughs> the way that our economies are working now that we, we understand a little bit more about the wealth distribution? Thank you very much. Um, so, we now have, we're almost debtors in terms of time. Um, we did start a little late, so I think we can run just a little late, but um, we do have to be out of the room, we do have to think about our, our stewards. Um, so I'm going to run for just five more minutes, um, but then we can continue the conversation up the road um, in the Garrick over a glass of wine or a soft drink, if you prefer. So please join us for that. So I'm just going to take, um, I think, three points, if there are three points, and then hand back to Tony to respond. So in the front here, could you quickly say who you are, in this case, Atta Hussein? Atta Hussein from the London School of Economics. Mm -hmm. And just uh, thinking of some of the important events of last few years and the world's inequality. And the point is that the crisis also is coincided with called quantitative easing, which pumped billions of dollars, trillion, almost more than a trillion dollars, into the money market, which The value of financial assets has risen faster than physical assets, and it particularly favors the rich because they hold much greater proportion of their wealth in financial assets than physical assets. Right. Thank you very much. Other points in, this, in the third row in the um, middle there? Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's Shaquille from I'm study here. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, reliability of data, and I think the income data is always kind of underreported. Uh, so in, in your view, to what extent the, uh, the data has been underreported? Uh, so what kind of a difference we can see if the data is fully reported, and how can that impact on the, on the distribution? And secondly, uh, I mean, to what extent these kind of analysis would be truly reflecting uh, the situation in developing countries? 
where uh, data on, especially on income and financial assets or like, you know, the documentation is very weak and data is not available. Uh, and I think that, that might be one of the reasons that you have very few uh, kind of billionaires or millionaires from the developing countries. And I suspect that there would be many if we have kind of a more reliable data from developing countries. Thank you. Okay, I'll give Tony a chance to respond to all of those in a second, and then a final point, and then I'll, I think Tony can wrap up. So is that, are you passing? Um, Andrew Summers, uh, Law Department. Um, one of Piketty's suggestions uh, in relation to his uh, annual wealth tax would be that it would be useful to levy a tax at a tiny, tiny rate, at least to begin with, just for the purpose of collecting more data on the distribution of wealth. How compelling, Tony, do you find um, that argument? How much would that enrich the data set that you currently have available? Right, thank you very much. So, Tony, <coughs> let, let me, let you, me let you respond to all of those um, and also to the points that Deborah and Abigail um, raised and then we can carry on the conversation uh, afterwards. Yes, let me, uh, I don't know whether I'll try and cover all of them, so... Uh, uh, forgive me if I don't uh, cover things. Let me just pick out a few things which I did pick up. A question about whether we should use PPP and ex against uh, exchange rates. Um, I, I can see the benefit of that. Uh, the problem we found is when we start to quote lots of different calculations, people get a bit confused. And uh, on the whole, um, I think <coughs> it's easier to perhaps focus on, on one and uh, perhaps uh, have the other as a sort of a, a footnote somewhere. Um, you do have to decide which one to go with. On the whole, I, I can see a case for using a sort of uh, constant exchange rates rather than the current one because there is just a lot of volatility there. As a discussion about Sweden and student loans and things like that, government-held assets, I think that's, that's quite interesting. We did one of our... Uh, one of our um, no, I haven't. Uh, I could go back a bit and just um, actually say that one of our previous studies was actually on wealth mobility, <laughs> if you mentioned that, um, but also on debt. And we did there um, sort of introduce government debt alongside household debt, um, and that was quite interesting. One of the one of the interesting things was Norway, which has this huge. Uh, um, a huge positive uh, government uh, surplus, um, and so uh, that uh, changed things. I think when we find high inequality in places like Sweden, our interpretation is not so much that people are, um, well, maybe it's a different way of interpreting what you were saying, is <clears throat> that essentially people accumulate, they have a choice, either they save or they spend, uh, often they save because they, they, they're worried about uh, having assets for the future. If you don't have very good government pensions, if you don't uh, have a good health service, uh, you're more likely to think I ought to be saving something in case I need this for the future. In countries which have good, uh, good social systems, and that's pretty well the Scandinavian countries uh, very noticeably, people don't, have to, don't feel such a strong motivation so the difference in Sweden is that essentially there's a large part of the population that feel that they perhaps don't have a great reason to, to have to accumulate. Um, and then there's a few uh, people who are running businesses and they're involved in the, in the international markets and of course they, they are doing very well. And because the rest of the population uh, isn't so uh, uh, striven, if you like, with uh, or motivated, uh, the inequality looks high, and that's uh, true in pretty well all the, all the uh, Scandinavian countries seem to have high inequality. The other reason is the student loans do come up in these countries, or at least they have a lot of uh, very high uh, negative amounts for the uh, bottom uh, decile or quintile in the distribution. And I think there it's partly a, a question of not... Uh, it's really quite difficult because I think... The debt is really not too true debt in some cases. I mean, I know in Sweden, I was, I was talking to, I used to, I gave a seminar once and the students were telling me, and, and even the adults were saying, you have uh, debt, uh, you, student debt in Sweden, 
You don't have to pay it back unless your earnings are a certain level. But after some point, it's, it's waived anyway. And there's no incentive. Uh, so people who even, they don't, they don't have to wipe, they don't have to pay their debt before they take out a mortgage. So they, they can go and live normally and just set this debt aside. And at some point, they may have to pay it back. Maybe they don't. Uh, but the reason why it does appear on their, on, their, uh, uh, on their assets and debts all the time. So I think you know, if one knew exactly how much of this debt or realistically uh, valued it, we might have a different uh, uh, situation there. Um, with uh, <clears throat> Deborah about, I think, it, the way that I would uh, um, respond to that is the trouble with... Um, looking at the distribution and say, really, this is outrageous, we've got to do something about it, is the knee-jerk reaction is tax rates. Um, um, and I, I actually uh, I pick up on the point about wealth tax. I mean, it'd be wonderful to have that data, but on the whole, I'm not sure whether it would be reliable data. It might be better than the sort of we, data we have. But the UK actually has, it has survey data and it also has inheritance tax data and it has a long series. <clears throat> so it's not one of the countries that's really deficient, data deficient. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, and uh, it seems to me that the problem is that no one, if one would say, would you sit down and design an economy or, or reward system, the one that we have, you're, you're saying it's crazy. I mean, if, if a young person can set up Facebook and get $30 billion before they're 30 years old. I don't, I don't know what, exactly what the numbers are, but you know, no one in their right mind would set up a system to do that. I mean, once you've got the, the billion, I would think you know, the second billion is, is really not, uh, not a pressing need. And in fact, as soon as they get this money, they start to think of ways of giving it away. So you can tell that there must be something a little bit uh, awry with that. The other thing is that people only make this money because of the property rights structure that's in place. They only do it because we have some systems in which we have patent rights and we've got copyrights. Um, and that is really protecting them. And they get this for free. They make these billions, uh, but they never really have to uh, pay for it. And in fact, you look at a developing country which opens up their market and gives these ability to these people to... Uh, 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 make their fortunes and never gets anything out of it and no, hasn't really no prospect of any one of their, of really a serious prospect, I think, of their citizens uh, being rewarded in this sort of way. So uh, that's what I would say. Um, uh, the, other, the final point is about QE, and I have to say I totally agree with you. I mean, this is what the Bank of England's been doing. The quantitative easing, what has it been doing? It's been keeping interest rates low. The reason why asset prices have gone up is because interest rates go are low and people can't find any, any other way of, uh, of channeling their money uh, investments into, into good uh, activities. So they pour it into uh, buying these financial uh, assets and, um, and the asset uh, prices go up. And of course, what's going to happen when, when quantitative easing comes to a halt it's likely that there will be uh, some serious uh, reductions in asset prices and uh, some of this will unravel. I mean, at least that's one of the prospects. I, I can't say I'm a, an expert in this area, but I would think uh, if, if, if people do think that quantitative easing has uh, been uh, supporting the uh, uh, keeping asset prices high and, and, and effectively uh, reinforcing inequality, then I would not uh, dispute that. Thank you very much. We are going to have to leave it there before we're actually physically thrown out of the room. Um, but please follow us up the Old Witch to the corner to the Garrick, and we can carry on the conversation there. In many ways, this is an unfortunate moment for those of us worried about inequality in terms of global events. But we're actually, as a generation, remarkably fortunate in the kind of data that are now available to us to understand what's going on. And it's thanks to people like Tony and his colleagues that we're in that position. So thank you very much for that, as well as for this evening. Thank you.